Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is going to be kind of our theme verse uh, for this particular study. This is the fourth lesson in a lesson in a series of six lessons that I call Bible Basics. I put these together around 40 years ago or so and have been using them to help ground believers in belief and behavior. These are Bible basics. Lesson five, we'll get into some things probably that are not quite so basic, and, and I have debated about revising my lesson and taking some things out of it to make it more basic. But these are all basic things that a Christian ought to know. When you get done, when, when we get done, Lord willing, this will take two weeks. And when we get done, I'll give you a lesson plan that basically has the main statements that I'll be making that are on the board up here and the verses that we'll be referring to, reading, quoting, and I'll be trying to write these up, the verses up here as well. And all of that will be on your lesson plan, so you will have the notes. If you want to take notes during this thing, you can, but you will uh, have the notes when we get done. Plus, I'll be giving you a take-home test that's open book test, and it's strictly for you to be able to get a hold of these things even more. Look up the verses and get a hold of what I'm trying to get across to you. Well, I hope the Holy Spirit will endeavor to get across to you in this series of lessons. This lesson could be, if you're saved, this lesson could be the most important of all six because the Word of God is what your whole life needs to be grounded upon. The Word of God is how you got saved. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And in this lesson, we're going to look at what the Scriptures say about the Scriptures. And I've jotted them down twice here, that when I'm referring to the Bible, I'm referring to this one that I'm holding in my hand which is a King James 1611 Authorized Version Bible. Uh, that's what I believe the Bible is. I've never seen the original, the original manuscripts that uh, Chuck Swindoll and, and Sproul and MacArthur and all these guys talk about, the original manuscripts, but here's the good news. They haven't either. They don't know what they're talking about. But I do believe in this book that I hold in my hand as the Scriptures, and we're going to be looking at what the Bible says about the Bible. We'll be looking at what the scriptures say about the scriptures. If you have 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want you to look please at verse 16. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, this will be kind of like a theme verse for this lesson. The Bible is the infallible Word of God. I like to say that the Bible, this King James Bible, is the infallible, inerrant, and inspired Word of God. But the Bible is the infallible Word of God given to man by inspiration of God through and by the Holy Ghost. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, if you have it, says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so God gave His Word by inspiration. And God gives His Word by inspiration. And when we talk about inspiration, all inspiration has to do is with the breath of God in it. Okay? So inspiration is has breath, and inspiration refers to something being alive. Okay? Without going to any Hebrew, Greek, or Spanish, or Portuguese, or any other language to explain what inspiration means. Inspiration, matter of fact, if you look it up in an English dictionary, you may not believe this. But inspiration actually does have to do with your breath. When, uh, when you look it up and look up the various definitions in English of the word inspiration, actually inspiration has to do with you inhaling. And guess what happens when you are exhaling? expiration. When you exhale for the last time and can't inhale again, you know what you're going to do? One of the words that they use to describe what has happened? Expired. You have expired. <laughs> okay? So if something is, is inspired, it's alive. 
It's living. When something has expired, it is dead. I personally believe that the Bible's life has been preserved. And I believe that this book is quick and powerful. And the word quick in Hebrews 4.12 is not just a reference to fast, but it's a reference to something being alive. So you've got 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. If you can find it and want to turn there, I'd like to invite you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's a real blessing to be able to be a part of a Bible-believing church that actually believes that the Bible that, that we're reading is the Word of God. And uh, the next verse I'd like to write up here for you is 1 Thessalonians 2.13. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And 1 Thessalonians 2.13 expresses the way I feel about this church and this class here. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And when you talk to some of your unsaved relatives and you give them the scriptures about something, many times they will come back to you with something like, well, that's just man's opinion. That's just man's book. And the Muslims have their books and the Mormons have their books and, and so forth. And they don't receive this book as the Word of God. What a blessing it is. Paul thanked God for the Thessalonians because they received the Word of God as it is in truth the Word of God. I'd like you to take your Bibles now, please, and turn to 2 Peter if you can find it. It's going toward the book of Revelation. And if you'll turn back going toward the book of Revelation and get to 2 Peter chapter 1, it'll be past Hebrew. Everybody knows that's the book that proves that men are supposed to make the coffee in the morning, right? Yeah. Hebrews. Get past Hebrews. It's kind of a little bigger book. I kind of use it as a guidepost and thumbing through my Bible in the, the rear of the Bible. To get past Hebrews, you should be able to get to James, 1 Peter, then 2 Peter, chapter 1. And first, 2 Peter, chapter 1. I'll take the time to read this, and then we'll, then we'll move on a little more quickly through these next points. I want to show you how important it is for you to believe this Bible like we believe this Bible here. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His glory. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now, I want you to pause there a moment. We're going to come back to verse 19. Have you ever in your early days of reading your Bible or early days of being a Christian, have you ever thought about what it would be like if you could have been there to actually hear Jesus speak? Have you ever thought about it, what it would have been like for you to actually see Him do some of the miracles? Uh, have you ever thought about what it would have been like for you to have been able to hear with your ear God speak from heaven and say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, that'd be great. Peter had heard that voice. He's very privileged. But... I want you to notice after he said, we heard that voice. He's making a point. And after he says this voice which came from heaven, we heard, in verse 19 he says this. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Something more sure than what he heard with his own ears come from heaven. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart. What's he talking about? Verse 20 will explain what he's talking about. Knowing this first, 
that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I don't have room to get this in here. Let me put 2 Peter 1.20. 21 like that. So, your Bible is more sure. A lot of times we think, oh, if God would just speak from heaven. You don't have to have God speak from heaven. you got something more sure than that. Okay? I mean, you may think that you're hearing voices, God, uh, God's voice from heaven when all you're hearing is a voice over the speaker at Walmart. <laughs> Socially distance everybody. You're at Walmart. We are in charge of your health and welfare. Um, so number two, after we looked at the fact that the Bible is given by inspiration, it's God's Word. I want you to receive it as God's Word, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Realize that it's, that it's more sure than if you were to hear God speak audibly to your Floppies, you got to. Anybody remember back in the computer days when they used to call them floppies? Yeah, floppies. Floppy floppy yeah. They weren't floppies. So I always thought it was like I thought of your ear. But uh, number two, the Bible. This is a shocker for a person when they get to read this the first time. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 138. And what we want to say secondly is the Bible actually has a higher place than anything else, including. God's own name. If you'll turn to Psalm 138. I remember when I read this for the first time. It was amazing to me. Psalm in the Old Testament is about in the middle of your Bible. By the way, those of you that um, are in this class, one of the First things that can help get you going in a good direction about your Bible, uh, one of the things that can help you is to try to take the time and just get somebody to work with you on it. You can do it, believe it or not. I would recommend everybody in this class try to take the time to memorize the titles of the books of your Bible in order. And it can be done. There are only 66 of them. That may sound like a lot, but uh, by association with each other and all that. You heard me mention that I like to use Hebrews as kind of a landmark in the New Testament going toward the end. But by using uh, certain places as landmarks as you do your memory work, uh, you'll, uh, I mean, for instance, when you get to First and Second Corinthians, certainly you can put those two together, right? Um, and you do that with others. Uh, I would recommend that, that you do that, and it will help you. If anybody ever says, would you turn to this, and you want to find it before next week, okay? Uh, if you've memorized the titles, it'll help you. All right, Psalm 138, verse 2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Now look at this. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Is that amazing? I can't hardly think of anything that would be higher than the name of Jesus Christ. We certainly don't want to swear and cuss by the name of Jesus, do we? We certainly don't. Because we that name should be held in reverence. The Bible says concerning that name, that wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And so that name is above every name, but there's something above the name that is above every name. And according to Psalm 138, verse 2, uh, that thing that's above the name that's above every name is the Word of God. Take your Bibles now, please, and turn in the New Testament to 2 Thessalonians. See if you can find 2 Thessalonians. And it's toward the rear of your Bible as well. It'll be before you get to Hebrews. See if you can find 2 Thessalonians. Here's an interesting prayer request in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul asked the Thessalonian believers to pray for him. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. And here's what he said. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. And that can mean a number of things. I believe one of the things it's a reference to is, is that there would not be hindrances to the word of God going out. But he says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course, and then notice the second request, and be glorified, even as it is with you. He prayed and requested prayer that the word of the Lord would be glorified. Now, if you glorify the word of the Lord, there's a number of ways to do it. You glorify the Lord by the word of the Lord by obeying it, by living by it, by fashioning your life after what this book says. But if you glorify the word of the Lord as the word of the Lord, there are people who are going to accuse you of worshiping the Bible. But we'll worship the Bible, but we do glorify the Bible. That's what it says. Pray that the word of the Lord would be glorified. And uh, it, uh, it's not it, it's not worshiping uh, the pages to glorify it as the word of the Lord. But the word of the Lord shows the integrity of the Lord. Alright, let's say that I just picked out one of our uh, members of our class here this morning. Not all of you are real acquainted with each other. Not everybody's real close with each other. And, and if I were to tell you behind the scenes, okay, about somebody that was at our class today, and you know how preachers gossip. Let's say that I, behind the scenes, I went over to you and I said, now, this lady right here, she's a nice lady, good personality, and all that. She lives good, but you can't believe a word she says. <laughs> okay? Now, I said some good things about the lady, whoever the lady might be. It could be just as well be a guy. Okay? Um, if I were to say it was a guy in a suit, it would have to be either you or me. Um... But if I, if I were to say a lady and they were, you'd say, well, man, she must not be much of a person. And the thing is, is there used to be a saying among the old people. I know because I are one. But there used to be a saying among the old people that he's as good as his word. And what it is, is your word shows your integrity. Somebody can count on the truthfulness and the accuracy of the things that you say and the fulfillment of the things you say that you will do and all that, then that points to your character. And you cannot have a good and high opinion of somebody if their word to you means nothing. Okay? And so you can't have really the, the awe and the reverence for God that you ought to have if you don't have some kind of awe and reverence for his word. The psalmist said one time, I stand in awe of thy word. So, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. The prayer was that the word of the Lord may be glorified. All right, number three. Why don't you take your Bibles, please, and turn to Proverbs. If you split your Bible down the middle, you should be close to Psalms. If you find Psalms, hang it right. And Proverbs will be to the right. Psalms, Proverbs. Why don't you go to Proverbs chapter 22. And there we're going to look at a verse from which I brought this statement. And that is, the Bible was put in written form so man can know what is and what is not the Word of God. There are advantages to talking to somebody rather than just writing something down. I prefer face-to-face -face communication, secondly, voice-to-voice -voice communication, before textual uh, communication, okay? Um, and textual communication, unless you use a bunch of smiley faces and icons and things like that, it's hard for a text to express your emotions. Many times my texts seem really hard, okay? Uh, and so I'll oftentimes put a put a smiley face at the end of a lot of things that I write. If I, if I put a note, if I leave a note on the door of somebody's house saying I came by, I just about will always draw a smiley face on there. 
so that they know I didn't come by to collect tithes. <laughs> you know, I didn't come by to jump on their throat because they missed uh, last Sunday and, and uh, you know, and wanted to try to get onto them real bad. Put a smiley face, let them know I, I love them. But there is an advantage over having something spoken and something written down. And uh, a couple of things you can think about. Number one is, if it's just spoken, you may not remember it exactly as it was said. You know, you ever had a disagreement with somebody over something that was said? Y'all both heard it, but you and the person disagree about what was really said. I've raised two kids. I've experienced that a whole lot. Okay, mm. and it's where you, you know, no, oh, Dad, you didn't say that. You know, oh, yes, I did, and. Um, and the fact is, is that if three people hear something, let's say that, that everybody in this class hears me teach this class, and then somebody leaves this class and goes and tells somebody that they're trying to get to this class, uh, to, to come to this class, they say, well, the preacher says if you use a different Bible than the King James Version, you're going to hell. <laughs> okay? And... Um, and somebody says, wait a minute, I was in that class, I didn't hear that. You know? And so we had two different people disagreeing by what they heard. And somebody said, well, who am I to believe? One says one thing, one says the other. But if you've got it written down, what the preacher said, okay? Preacher, preacher may have written it down somewhere that says, anybody who uses the New American Standard Bible is going to hell. Okay, if I wrote it down, you know, and I, and I haven't changed my mind since I wrote it down, and then I would say, yeah, that's exactly what I believe. But uh, if something is written down, you can know the certainty. There may be some misinterpretations of what's been written down, but uh, at least you know what was said. Now, if you have Proverbs, would you look, please, at chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. We're going to look at verse 20 and 21. Proverbs chapter 22. And if you don't mind underlining in your Bible, I'll get you to underline a couple words or highlight them. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 20 says, Have not I written, and I've underlined the word written, have not I written to thee in uh, excellent things and counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth, to them that send unto thee. So one of the things that's a blessing about having something written down is, I heard a fellow put it this way to me one time years ago. This was in my second pastor, which was about 80 years ago. It wasn't that long ago, but, but about 40 years ago. And in my second pastor, I heard a guy say this. I was visiting with him. He was just a visitor in our church. And, and I heard him say this in his living room. And he says, Preacher, you know what? We can argue about what it means. He said, but the thing is, at least, it says what it says. And that's something that, that is a blessing if you have the Bible in written form. That's why the words are important. is because you need to understand what it says and be able to go from there. All right, take your Bibles if you're in Proverbs. I want you to uh, back up to Psalms. Take a left. If you're in Proverbs, and go to Psalms. And we'll turn to Psalm 12. Most people use the word inspiration to apply to the original manuscripts. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible doesn't say much about the word inspiration. The word inspiration is only found in two, Bi two Bible verses. Um, the one is 2 Timothy 3.16, and most people think that that verse says all Scripture was given by inspiration of God, but that's not what it says. It says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And when you use the word inspired and inspiration, there's people who try to make a differentiation between whether that you say the Bible was inspired in the original writings or the original writers were inspired or the Word of God itself was inspired. And I personally believe the Word of God is inspired. <laughs> okay? Uh, not only was it, I believe it was, I believe it is. And I use the term 
with reference to God giving His Word in the sense of life. It's a living book. Okay, This is the real living Bible. Some of y'all know there's another version called the Living Bible. That's not the Living Bible. This is the real Living Bible, this King James Bible that we have here. That Living Bible, anybody got one? Confess up, come on. <laughs> we have a Trash for Treasure program here. If you'll bring your Living Bible here, I'll give you a good King James Bible. But the Living Bible actually says on the cover, Living Bible Paraphrased. And the neat thing about that is, is I believe that's exactly what it is, is they have changed the words to what is the Living Bible. The Living Bible is your King James. The Word of God is quick and powerful. The word quick there referring to uh, being alive. Now if you have Psalm 12, what I want to uh, take Psalm 12 and talk to you about is, is I believe that the inspiration is preserved. In other words, if it had life then, it's got life now. If it was inspired then, it's inspired now. If it's God's Word then, I believe it's God's Word now. And it's somewhere, okay, it's available. People say, well, if God has kept the Word in the King James Bible, then that, and then he, where's the Word of God in Spanish? Where's the Word of God in this? And where's the Word of God in that? And they feel like that because that God has got His Word available in English, and I believe it is, that that means that God has to, that's called this fairness stuff, you know, God's got to be fair. And that means that God has to have His Word perfectly in every language. But that's baloney. There's nothing in the Bible that says that God has to have His Word available in every language. God did not give the Word of God the first time in every language. As far as we know, okay, as far as we know, the original writings of the Old Testament were primarily Hebrew. They have a thing called Syriac and Biblical Aramaic, but, but primarily Hebrew and the Old and the New Testament, they say primarily Greek. You don't know how I am about Hebrew and Greek, right? I know a little bit of Hebrew, I know a little Hebrew and a little Greek, and the little Hebrew has a clothing store and the little Greek runs a restaurant. Okay, that's about all I know about it. Um, I know about as much Greek as I do Spanish, but the um, you do not uh, have to go to the Greek uh, to have the Word of God to, uh, today. You can go to the English, and somebody says, "Well, uh, they, we we don't have it in all of the languages." Uh, then uh, how can you claim that your English Bible is perfect? And I just say again, that when the Bible was given the first time, God did not give it in every language. Okay, He gave it in Hebrew and the New Testament. He gave it primarily in Greek, though you have some people uh, fuss about that. I don't spend a lot of time talking about it. But what I want to sh show to you is <clears throat> that God's Word, these things that some people would agree, uh, about the original manuscripts. There's people who don't believe our King James Bible is perfect, but they believe that the Bible, the Bible, is the infallible Word of God. They just don't know where it is. There's some people who believe that about the Bible, but the Bible to them refers to the original manuscripts. So I'm we'll going to give you something that's not quite so basic. Am I talking too slow? No. Okay. I'll <laughs> okay, give something that's not quite so basic, but that is that if the Bible is only, if the scriptures refer only to the original writings, here's one problem about that. For people who believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God, and when they talk about Bible, they just mean original writings. When they say scriptures, they just mean the original writings. Here's the problem about that. As far as anybody knows, the original writings of Genesis through Revelation were never collated into one book. Okay? As far as anybody knows, there's no record, no proof that anybody has ever had the original writing of Genesis all the way through to the original writing of Revelation and had them in one book. So, if what they say, and I say they, you know, as kind of a straw man, but there are a lot of these straw men around, but when they say that the Bible is a reference only to the original manuscripts, then in their definition, the Bible never existed. Because by their definition, the Bible has to refer to the original manuscripts, and the Bible is a collection of 66 books. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is a collection of 66 books. And if it's just the original manuscripts, it doesn't exist. But here's what we believe. We believe God's Word has been providentially, perfectly preserved. 
I believe that it's available today in the worldwide language of the end time. It's available in English. If you have Psalm 12, we'll read verses 6 and 7. Psalm 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Notice who is given the task in that verse of preserving the word. God. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Psalm 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You'll have these verses if you don't get them. I'd like you to turn. We're about to come to a close. I'd like you to turn uh, to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And we'll read a verse here to get ready to close up our class this morning. We'll finish this up, God willing, next week. While you're turning to Matthew chapter 24, I want to read you a verse out of the Old Testament prophet, the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 8. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. That's Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. And if you have Matthew chapter 24, I'd like you to look at a statement of our Lord in Matthew chapter 24. This has to do with preservation of Scripture. I mean, what's going to happen once the original manuscripts wear out? You think God gave the Scripture just where it lasts for one generation? Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Give you one other one. See, my word's not worth much because I think I said that was a laugh. Give you one more. That'll finish up this number four. We'll get number five, God willing. Can you all help me remember this arrow? This is where we'll start up next week. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You got Matthew 24.35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. God has preserved His word. I will say this before we dismiss in prayer, that, and I'll remind you of this again next week, Lord willing, but Ms. O'Neill can get you these if you want to do some further study and some small booklets. You can buy, there are a number of full-length books, some of them more boring and tedious than others. Uh, mine are small but boring. But um, Ms. O'Neill's got some little booklets that are $2 a piece. One's called, Do We Have the Word of God? That's the case for the King James Bible. One's called, Read Your Bible Through. And it'll encourage you and give you some guidelines for reading your Bible through from front to back, at least once a year. One's called the preservation of Scripture. That's about the truth that we are talking about here. I've written a whole little booklet on it that's about 30 minutes of spoken material. It'll take you about 10 minutes to read probably. And then I've written another one called How to Recognize a Bad Bible. And just about all the, ver the versions of the Bible in English uh, correspond with one another in the things they select to change uh, in the Word of God from your King James. And this... That little booklet shows you that they are more than just changing the and thou to you and your and you and you guys if you're from the north uh, or y'all if you're from the south. It's, um, it's, it affects some pretty important doctrines. Let's bow our heads together for a word of prayer. Dear Father.